Hi, welcome to this video in Linear Programming Duality. In this video, we're going to be discussing the algorithmic aspects of Farkash Lemma. So Farkash Lemma says that if we're given the system ax equals b and x non-negative, then exactly one of the following two conditions is true. So either one, there exists an x-bar such that the constraints are satisfied, in other words, the system is feasible, or two, there exists a y-bar such that a transpose y-bar is non-negative and b transpose y-bar is strictly negative. So, um, since condition 1 is equivalent with the system being feasible, and we're saying exactly one of the following is true, that means that condition 2 is equivalent with the system being infeasible. And that's the reason that we regard this vector y bar as a certificate of infeasibility, because it's going to exist if and only if the system is infeasible. So this is what we discussed in the previous video. We stated and proved this fact, known as Farkash Lemma. Um, so Farkash Lemma is equivalently saying that every infeasible system of this type uh, necessarily has a certificate of infeasibility, but it doesn't show us how to actually obtain such a certificate of infeasibility. So, um, so that's effectively what this comment is saying. It's saying that we know that such a vector y exists if the system is infeasible, but how can we actually go about finding it? So that's the purpose of this video, is to algorithmically construct this vector y bar, provided that the system really is infeasible. So we're going to start with a linear program with these types of constraints, and if that linear program is infeasible, we want to find this uh, vector y bar. Just as a heads up before we get into the content of this video, we will be relying on some features of linear programming outside of duality itself, namely the simplex algorithm, and specifically some subroutines of the simplex algorithm, uh, like uh, auxiliary linear programs and canonical forms. So if you're not familiar with these things, maybe for now it would just be better to accept that uh, algorithmic methods do exist, and then we can just kind of move on from there. Uh, and then you can come back to this video when uh, you're more comfortable with those topics. Uh, having said that, though, we can still discuss at a high level what's going on without getting into the gritty details, so let's at least do that be first before we dive into the main content. So here's the general overview of what's going to happen. Uh, the setting is that we're going to be given a linear program, which is a maximization problem subject to matrix equality constraints and variable non-negativity constraints. And these are exactly the type of constraints specified in the hypothesis of Farkash Lemma. So this is what we're given. This will be called uh, P, or we'll call it. So the linear program P is what we start with, and our goal is to find a feasible solution uh, to P or to provide a certificate of infeasibility, Y, if we've determined that this is instead infeasible. So the way that this works is that you start with your linear program P, and then you construct the auxiliary linear program Q. So we'll label this auxiliary. And the purpose of the auxiliary is that it retains a lot of the information from P, and, in fact, it's going to necessarily have an optimal solution by the construction. And so what you do is you run the simplex algorithm on it. And so the simplex algorithm will find an optimal solution, and then we can characterize the feasibility, or lack thereof, of the initial linear program P in terms of some condition based on the optimal solution of Q. So if the optimal solution that the simplex algorithm finds for Q satisfies some particular condition, then P will be feasible, and will also find a feasible solution associated with it. On the other hand, if the condition isn't satisfied, then P will not be feasible, it'll be infeasible, and at that point, we would then ask for a certificate of infeasibility. So assuming that that's what happens here, uh, that it's infeasible, what you do from this point is that you take Q into its canonical form. So we'll write can of Q, that's canonical form of Q, with respect to the particular basis that uh, the simplex algorithm found. So let's call this arrow canonical. Um, so the simplex algorithm, it, uh, it iterates through various bases until it gets to an optimal solution, and the basis that it ends at is called, the, uh, is called a, a, an optimal basis. And so we're putting it in canonical form for that optimal basis, and when you look at the objective function for this um, canonical form of Q, you, uh, you, there is a vector there which is called y bar. So there's a y bar vector which is in the objective function of the canonical form. We're not saying that this y bar is a certificate of infeasibility, it's just a vector that shows up when you go into canonical form uh, for a linear program. But what actually happens is that this vector y bar is in fact going to be a certificate of infeasibility for this initial linear program P. That's what our claim is. So the y bar that shows up in the canonical form of Q is our certificate of infeasibility, and this is the process that you go through to find this y bar. You start with P, construct the auxiliary, go into canonical form for the optimal basis that the simplex algorithm finds, and, um, and then that vector y bar in canonical form, which is in the objective function, 
uh, that's the certificate of infeasibility. So that's how this works. Now we can go on and flesh out the details of how this whole process works, um, but just before we do that, let's just take note of one observation. Um, we can actually assume that this vector b here, we can assume that b is non-negative without loss of generality. And the way that we, the reason we can do that is because if you look at all the components here, th these are all matrix equality constraints. So if there was a component which was negative, then it corresponds to some particular linear equation. And so uh, what you can do is you just divide both sides by minus one. And so that's going to flip the b component to be positive, and that minus sign just gets absorbed on the left-hand side instead. Uh, but it doesn't change the actual equation because, of course, it's an equation, so you're just dividing by minus one. So uh, nothing changes except where the minus sign goes. It goes from right side to left side, so you just shift any negatives to, uh, to the left-hand side instead, and now your right-hand side is all non-negative components. So we'll see how this will be helpful when we, uh, when we construct the auxiliary. So now we're ready to actually go through the construction of the certificate of infeasibility. So here's what we're going to do in three steps. So this is a sketch, and we'll implement these three steps, and that will constitute the actual construction. So um, before anything, uh, we start with our linear program P, and then in the first step, you construct the auxiliary linear program, and you run the simplex algorithm on it. And so what happens is that P will have a feasible solution if and only if the optimal value of Q is equal to zero. So this is the condition of the optimal solution that we were discussing above. And so um, we can detect whether or not the optimal value of Q is equal to zero because the simplex algorithm will give us an optimal solution. Um, and so therefore, that will allow us to detect whether or not P has a feasible solution. And so if P does have a feasible solution, um, by the construction of the auxiliary, uh, we'll be able to map a, the optimal solution of Q onto a feasible solution of P. And so that will solve our problem then. We'll have concluded that P is feasible. On the other hand, if P is infeasible, uh, well then now we would like our certificate of infeasibility. So let's go into step two. So step two is assuming that P is infeasible, rewrite Q in canonical form for the optimal basis B that was given in the final stage of the simplex algorithm. So the simplex algorithm itself is actually implicitly writing uh, the uh, linear program in canonical form for every basis that it iterates through. But that's, that's all happening implicitly, and we don't get to see that. We only get to see the end result of the algorithm. So we need to manually do this ourselves so that we can actually see the canonical form, because that's where our uh, certificate of infeasibility will come from. So we'll manually do this ourselves, rewriting Q in canonical form for this optimal basis. And what happens is that if you look at the objective function, so here in step three, uh, the vector y bar in canonical form of the objective function will be a certificate of infeasibility. So um, by certificate of infeasibility, we mean what's specified in Farkash lemma, which is that, first of all, we need A transpose Y bar uh, to be greater than or equal to zero, and second of all, we need B transpose Y bar to be strictly negative. So this is what it means to be a certificate of infeasibility. So this Y bar is coming from the objective function in canonical form for this uh, linear program Q. So now let's actually implement this. So first of all, we start with our linear program P, and so that's going to be uh, max C transpose X such that um, AX equals B and X is non-negative. And uh, so that's what P is. And remember, we're now assuming that this vector B is itself non-negative as well. So now to construct the auxiliary linear program, uh, well, we want it to be a maximization problem so that that way we can run the simplex algorithm on it. And so uh, let's write it as a maximization problem. So I'll just write it and then I'll explain the notation. So zero bar minus one transpose X bar U. Um, okay, so this is the objective function, and the way that you're supposed to read this is, um, th this is a block matrix form, or block vector form in this case, I guess, but um, in particular, this is not a fraction. We're not saying 0 over minus 1. This bar is just for visual purposes, because these are blocks of zeros and minus 1s. So what we're saying here is that we have a whole bunch of 0 components, and then that's followed by a whole bunch of minus 1 components. And so we're just visually separating the zeros from the minus 1s um, with this bar here. Um, but the zeros are going to be the coefficients that are associated with these x variables here, and uh, the minus ones are going to be associated with the u variables. Um, so we could have called these variables anything, since they are variables after all, um, but the reason that these are called x's is because they're supposed to correspond with the x variables in p. Um, so th there's a correspondence between these two uh, solution x in one of them maps to a solution x in the other, and you can basically just take them to be the same x, and, uh, and that works, so that's why they're called the same variable x. That's suggestive on purpose. 
the u variables, on the other hand, these don't appear in p. These are brand new variables that only appear in the auxiliary. And, uh, and so they're all going to appear with a coefficient of minus 1 in front of them. So the only question is how many components of u are there? And uh, the answer is that it's the same as the number of components of b. Because basically we're taking a u variable for every single constraint, uh, linear constraint of this um, system of matrix con equality constraints in the linear program P. So, uh, so that's how many. It's the number of constraints that appear there. Uh, so let's just say there's M of those. So um, let's say that um, if we write this out explicitly then, uh, it's, it's zeros times X's, so they just don't appear. And then we'll have minus ones times all the uh, U components. And so we'll have minus U1, minus U2, and then minus, and you just keep minusing everything, minus UM. Okay, so we're going to say that there's M components here. And, uh, and then we'll just draw, not, draw another arrow. Uh, so B and uh, U are both uh, M dimensional vectors. So this is what the objective function of Q works out to be if you uh, want to view it explicitly rather than as a dot product of vectors. But of course, they're just the same thing. Uh, now, for the constraints, uh, what you do is you look over to the constraints of P and you just write down some corresponding things in Q. So in P, we had uh, the matrix A times X equals B. So here what we're going to have is the same matrix A, but now appended by an identity matrix of the appropriate dimension so that this whole thing is rectangular. Um, so that's the matrix, and that's going to be multiplied by the vector X, U, and then that's going to be equal to the right-hand side, which will be, again, it's going to be B. So another way you can read this is just the matrix A times the vector X plus the identity matrix times the vector U, um, and that's equal to the right-hand side, which is B. And then finally, uh, we're going to again have variable non-negativity constraints. So X, U uh, is non-negative. So this is in standard equality form itself, which is good because we want to run the simplex algorithm on it. But you can see uh, that this is the appropriate format when you treat the matrix as A appended by I, and uh, the vector, as, um, the variable vector is x and then u. So this is the linear program q. So uh, let's write q below here, and we can box both of these things off. And, um, and we can just make a few observations about this linear program q. Um, so the, the whole point of the construction is that it will satisfy some properties that we need. So first of all, uh, q is feasible. And it's feasible um, because uh, the vector, if you take x, u, uh, to be the vector um, 0, bar, b. Uh, that will be a feasible solution. So remember, u and b are the same size, so you can take u to be equal to b. And b is non-negative, remember, we're assuming that. So this overall vector will be non-negative, and this uh, trivially satisfies the matrix equality constraints. So this is a feasible solution. Um, it's also going to be bounded uh, because the objective function is... Um, just subtracting, we're just subtracting all the u components, and they're all non-negative. So we're subtracting non-negative things, so that will make the overall value up here at most zero. So, um, so we can say that opt q uh, will be less than or equal to zero. And, uh, and then now we, as we've noted, um, the optimal value of q will be exactly equal to zero, if and only if p has a feasible solution. And that's because of this correspondence of solutions that we have. So if we have a solution x prime in, uh, f as a feasible solution to p, then what we can do is we can map that as a feasible solution uh, to q. Because what you can do here is uh, you can take the feasible solution to be the same x prime, and then you take all your u's uh, to be equal to zeros. Um, so this will be a feasible solution in the auxiliary. Now going the other direction, let's say that we had some uh, vector solution for q here. So we'll say x prime, uh, u prime, and we'll say uh, such that um, this works out to be equal to zero. So such that minus u1 prime minus 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 um prime equals zero. Um, so if this happens to be true, that you have some solution where you've attained this optimal value of zero, it's at most going to be zero, but if you attain that value of zero, then um, that must mean that all the u components individually are all zeros, since they're non-negative and they're being subtracted in the objective function. So, um, so, so th this means that all the u's are zeros, and so therefore um, the x prime, that's whatever the x prime is here, this maps uh, to uh, x prime being a feasible solution uh, to the linear program P. And so that's why that we have this condition above. We said the P is a, has a feasible solution if and only if the optimal value of Q is zero. So this map explains that reasoning, and, 
and in fact here is the explicit feasible solution x prime that we would get if we started with an optimal value uh, sorry an optimal solution of q so as we just noted uh, if we run the simplex algorithm on q and we get an optimal value which is zero then um, let's say this x prime u prime is an optimal solution which gives us zero then uh, this x prime will be a feasible solution for p and that solves the problem Instead, let's assume that we ran the simplex algorithm, got some optimal solution x prime u prime, which did not attain an optimal value of zero, um, then that means that we can't uh, map back to an x prime over here anymore um, because the u's are no longer zeros. Now we know that p is infeasible, and so now we're looking for our certificate of infeasibility. So uh, step two here is, um, so we're assuming the P is infeasible, we're going to rewrite Q in canonical form for this optimal basis B that the simplex algorithm found. So um, first of all, let's just write some words down. So, um, so first of all, run simplex on Q, um, and then we'll obtain um, opt solution X star U star, such that optimal value of q is strictly negative. Now let's say that this optimal solution here is a basic feasible solution for a basis b. Of course it is a basic feasible solution for some basis, we're just naming this basis. So um, we'll say that this is a basic feasible solution for basis b. So now um, we write q in canonical form uh, for b. So how does that work? Well, actually, we're not going to need to write the entire linear program. All we're concerned with is the objective function in canonical form for this basis. So how do you write things in canonical form? Well, um, you take a look at the linear program that you had here. We note that the coefficient vector is 0 bar minus 1, and the uh, matrix is A appended by the identity matrix. So if we come back down here, the objective function, so, um, so let's write can of q objective function. It's going to be the same objective function, just reformatted. And so the way it works is the new coefficients, uh, these coefficients are going to be the old coefficients. So uh, it's the old coefficients, which is 0 or minus 1 uh, transpose. Um, but now we're subtracting something off. We're subtracting off y bar transpose uh, times the matrix which appeared in the matrix quality constraints. And so that matrix is A appended by I. So, um, so it's Y bar transpose times the matrix A appended by I. Uh, now we haven't actually said what Y bar is just yet, um, but we'll note that in just a moment. Um, so this is the new coefficients, and, um, and so this is being multiplied by uh, the, the vector, which is X U, and, uh, and then we're adding plus Y bar transpose B. So we know what b is, we know what everything is, in fact, except for y bar. So um, y bar, it doesn't actually matter what this works out to be, it'll satisfy the appropriate properties regardless, but let's just write it down. Um, so y bar, um, this is going to be the matrix, which is, the matrix here is a appended by i, and then you take the submatrix of that indexed by the basic indices. And the basic indices, I mean the, the, in, the basis b here, these basic indices, so um, they pick out some particular columns. You just squash those together and get that submatrix. You take the inverse transpose of that, and then you multiply that uh, matrix by the uh, original coefficients. And the original coefficients were a bunch of zeros and then a bunch of minus ones corresponding to the x's and u's. And so, um, so 0 bar minus 1, that's also indexed uh, by the basic indices. So you're just taking the sub vector uh, indexed by these basic indices. So anyways, it doesn't actually matter that this is what it works out to be. It just is this, and so this way we have an explicit y bar here, but we only need the properties that y bar will satisfy in order to prove what we need to prove. Anyways, um, here is uh, all the data now. So this is our objective function, and what we want to prove is that this vector y bar actually acts as a certificate of infeasibility. So first of all, let's just note that um, this objective function here is equal to the original objective function. So this is equal to the original objective function, which is 0 minus 1 transpose x u. And so in particular, when you plug in an optimal solution, um, so here's an optimal solution, x star u star, um, the values come out to be the same. So 
um, when we plug in x star u star, so I'm just going to put stars on these variables now. So we'll say x star u star and x star u star, these are the same. But what do we know here? Well, this is an optimal solution for the linear program q, and so uh, we said above that we are assuming um, we're obtaining this optimal solution such that the optimal value of q is strictly negative. Because if it was equal to zero, then um, we would have actually concluded that p was feasible, but we're in the case that p is infeasible, so, so this was negative here. Um, so that means that zero uh, minus one transpose uh, times x star u star, this is negative. So that in turn means that this overall quantity here is also negative. But what is this overall quantity? Well, um, if you know how uh, the canonical form of an objective function works, when you plug in the basic feasible solution corresponding to the basis that you are in canonical form for, uh, then what that means is that this part uh, just vanishes and you're just left with this constant part which is y transpose b. So this overall quantity equals y bar transpose b. So let's just review why this entire uh, list of equalities and inequalities is, is true here. We have that these two objective functions are equal because they're simply reformattings of each other. One's in canonical form, one isn't, but they're the same thing, uh, so they're equal to each other. Um, this is negative because we are assuming that the optimal solution to Q here is negative. And, um, and then this thing is just equal to Y bar transpose B simply because this is the basic feasible solution for the basis that we are in canonical form for. So it reduces to this. And if you read this entire chain across, what you get is y bar transpose b is negative. So we can conclude, therefore, that uh, b transpose y bar is negative. Let me make that look more like a y bar. Um, let me just rewrite that whole thing, really. So that's the first uh, thing that we wanted to prove. So if we go back uh, to the top here, there was two things that we need to be true to be a certificate of infeasibility. In fact, we've proved the second thing. We uh, proved that b transpose y bar is strictly negative. So now, the thing that remains to show is that a transpose y bar is greater than or equal to zero. So let's come back down here and see how we can conclude that part. So let's put a check mark here. And so we want to show that, uh, that a transpose y bar is greater than or equal to zero. And the way that we can draw this conclusion is that we note that we ran the simplex algorithm and it terminated at this particular basis. So um, let's just say um, note simplex terminated at the basis B. So what that means that the simplex algorithm terminated is that, uh, well, the simplex algorithm is boosting coefficients that are positive uh, one at a time, and it's only going to stop when it can no longer find positive coefficients. So that must mean that this coefficient vector was um, completely non-positive. That's the only way that this would have stopped uh, happening, and of course it did because we said that we got an optimal solution here. So that's when it terminates. So um, that must mean then that this vector, uh, given here, this coefficient vector, is non-positive. So let's write that down. So this implies that um, 0 bar minus 1 uh, transpose minus y bar transpose a appended by i that whole vector is less than or equal to the zero vector. And now all we have to do is a bit of rearranging, and so this implies that uh, zero minus one transpose is uh, less than or equal to y bar transpose a appended by i. Now this is effectively what we wanted to conclude, but specifically we just need to look at the first block, um, because we have this inequality here, but really, uh, what we want to conclude is that the zero vector here is less than or equal to y bar times just the a columns. Because this y bar is going to be multiplied by all the columns of this overall matrix, but we're just concerned with the columns associated to the matrix A. So really, this is implying that zero transpose is less than or equal to y bar transpose times A. So the dimensions here do work out, by the way, because the zero vector, remember, uh, this zero was supposed to be in correspondence with the x's. So if we just look here, this is the um, original objective function for q, and um, so we have that the zeros were multiplied by the x's. So the zeros correspond to x's, and the x's correspond to the columns of a. We can go up even further here, back to um, the original linear program p, and we have that a times x equals b. So um, there's a component of x for every column of a. So there's also a component of x for every component of zero in that zero vector, so that must mean that there's the same number of zeros as there are columns of a.
Um, so that's just because the dimensions of this all work out. Uh, and so um, the, the point here is that there's uh, as many components here as there are columns of this matrix A uh, without the identity matrix. So we are justified in looking at just this top block and just this left block here. Um, these really are the appropriate components to look at. And uh, anyways, all this is to say that uh, we've concluded what we want because we can just rewrite this and this says that A transpose Y bar is greater than or equal to the zero vector. And that's what we wanted to show. So we can put a check mark there and we've uh, concluded both um, properties one and two um, up top here that we wanted to show. And so that shows that this vector Y bar is a certificate of infeasibility. And so this process that we went through of constructing the auxiliary um, and then writing Q, the auxiliary, in canonical form for this optimal basis B that the simplex finds, and then finally taking um, the uh, vector Y bar that appears in the objective function. So if we come back down here, uh, here's the objective function in canonical form for the auxiliary, and here's the vector Y bar. It appears two separate times, but uh, anyways, that vector Y bar is in fact our um, certificate of infeasibility, and so you can always find this by going through this process. So this really concludes the process of finding a certificate of infeasibility. There's actually a few more things that we can still say about Farkash Lemma. Um, we'll reserve those for one more video on this topic, but that will at least conclude it for this video on the algorithmic aspects. So that's it for this video. Thank you very much for watching.